Welcome back to the Alexander Schmid Podcast, episode 52. This is another one of our contemplative conversations with Mr. Wesley Chance. Mr. Wesley Chance, good morning. Hey, good morning, Alex. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. Uh, I'm really liking this new time that we're, we're often speaking at on uh, Saturdays, every other Saturday, it seems, when we do the radio podcast rather than the video. Yeah. I like uh, where it's about almost 9 a.m. here. It's uh, 8.45 or so. We wanted to do it at around 8.30. And I, I really like it um, for the discipline that it puts on my life. Like, for instance, last night I had a very nice Indian meal and I enjoyed that. And then I went to bed fairly early and then I got up at 6 a.m. today and had about two and a half hours of study um, and thought before I got to get on the phone with you. And we even started sharing with texts. And we had a conversation before this one, and it's it's been very pleasant. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, I agree. The discipline of it, well, it sort of like takes a little bit of the sting out of the week of work because you're coming back to work after having worked even harder than that over the weekend, doing lots of other programs and projects and stuff. So uh, it just kind of puts things in a in a perspective that I I do enjoy. And so just to frame this conversation for today, we were thinking about talking about some tree symbolism because, which may sound out of left field, but uh, I think it will connect uh, quite a bit with many of the mythological motifs that we've been thinking about, both pagan and uh, Christian. In particular today, probably we'll talk about Vikings, Zig Drassel, probably talk about uh, Jewish, Gnostic, Kabbalistic interpretations of the, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, and maybe even connect that to the uh, crucifix or the cross. And well, yeah. we just, since it's a concentration, let's see what we can do. And I'll just, uh, I'll just start reading this. This is from a text conversation we had earlier and um, uh, life going out of my voice for a minute, but maybe this will give us the best place to start. So yeah. leaving the cave, this is Plato's cave we're talking about is learning to think of finding your way out of the labyrinth, as it were, Minos's labyrinth or back into the cave for Plato or coming from heaven to the cross, which would be the Christian metaphor, is the remembering that the ability to think is rooted to one's actions in the world and the serves one's acting in the world by directing it appropriately and skillfully. But thinking in a non-Luciferian way, which is the problem with Milton's Lucifer, does not simply serve itself. And that is the problem with having so many useless college educated people right now all right this sort of, sort of political i don't know how much this is necessary but I'll, I'll just keep the thought going they will create or expand the bureaucracy and this is a claim made not only by peterson but by solhenitsyn as well a large-scale version of the individual who comprises it and it will eventually hit a critical mass and topple the state of any corporation uh, uh or any incorporated body like a corporation or a state this is also i would say what the idea behind both the flood story and the tower of babel are uh, like the protagonist of Dostoevsky's novels, Ivan, the underground man, Raskolnikov. Um, these are all individuals who are tremendously intelligent, but ultimately useless and, and also very much evil, um, like what a bureaucracy can become as it tends to become a tyranny. Um, but those who leave and return to transform, well, they get to use their intellects in the real game or reality where things really happen back in the cave, uh, though they have the light now. Or access to the light thinking they can make things change they're like john piaget's um uh, master uh, game player who can create the rules and create new games and so the yeah. tree recalls to us not only our origin and limitation limitation not only in that a tree is rooted to where it is but also has a particular form uh is uh also the key to success because if we do have a particular form there is a certain way to win or play the game right perhaps playing the game right is winning but from where we take uh, nourishment as well the fact that we have to get earthy <clears throat> because the hero is the capacity to transform the present for the better this is using a union campbellian and petersonian idea of the of the uh, individual or hero as the principle or as the embodied principle of transformation in the world transformation for the good because entropy tends to corrupt and destroy things by itself. And so God rested on the seventh day from the from uh, Genesis, the day or age of man, because God gave man the power to embody him. And so that's very interesting. And thus Jesus as the tree or the world tree 
Um, and by some accounts, some medieval accounts, uh, the idea became that the cross on which he was crucified was the tree of life. <clears throat> shows us that we are limited or bound in form, isomorphic. We all share the same form and thus the same nature and thus the same uh, way of being best in the world. But that is, that's a blessing, not a curse, as the um, protean Lucifer or the rational intellect, which wants to be everything, wants, mm -hmm. because it gives us purpose. Because without infinite limitation, there's no infinite meaning. And that is also the problem with totalitarian and anarchic states uh, both to the right and to the left if you have no order or rules like in an anarchy there can be no game but if there's too much order no room for choice and growth and change within the environment there can also be no game and so just to repeat god rests forever through granting us consciousness and thus the capacity to choose and we make it to heaven by going to a place where we no longer must choose like god in the seventh on the seventh day resting but insofar as we identify with that which transforms God or wit, which is God, our lives are not wasted and are spent embodying that which is eternal and thus connects us each to the eternal drama. We are part then of the great fabric of all things through space and time. All right. So that's all that I had to write. And wow, we really, uh, we really spanned uh, some, some grounds there, some ideas of what heaven is, some ideas of what God is and what the embodiment of God is and what uh, the reason of the embody or the story of Jesus as embodied God could mean and the capacity for all individuals potentially to be able to do that, just as in even the Egyptian religion. Uh, originally, there was God who was the emperor, then God who was the emperor and the nobles, and then God who or the Ta that was in all all of the humans, and that seems to be the idea behind a democracy too. Yeah, yeah. So that the voice of the people. Is the voice of God you know? because each yeah. person is an individual and each person says what he or she thinks and thus the mass of all the free speech that each person uses reflecting their own conscious thoughts is the mass of all conscious thoughts which exists and thus that which is ultimately conscious or the sum of all consciousness is the divine yeah um, well I think I mean I think even before you get to a democracy or even if your democracy is in some sense corrupted or over bureaucratized or however you want to look at it it seems true that the underlying foundation of any kind of human community is those people who make it up and who talk to each other and who make decisions and you know there's there's attempts of course to suppress or control that but you know nature finds a way and and if if human nature is intimately bound up with consciousness then i think yeah it's simply the case that all human governments are going to tend towards that that democratizing force which you're which you're describing there um and i think true to, it's true too that as much as a scientific materialistic reductive attitude towards uh nature might become more prominent at times because of its kind of output being so you know excellent and handy uh it's still the case that humans basically see the world in in religious or archetypal or mythological frameworks and our language is basically constructed that way. And, and it's just kind of like within us to, to see things that way. And I think, again, that, that religion is sort of perennial under the surface of even people who claim not to believe in any particular thing. You might, you might not call it God, but whatever it is that you are, are whatever is the principle of your action is in some sense your, your faith, you know? So. Right, and that actually sparked several thoughts in my mind, not only about the evolutionary nature of mythology and religion, as, in terms of being ve vehicles of communication of truth, um, and of how things are and how they manifest in the world through their specific language, but also I just it makes me think that we need more respect for the process of nature and our part within that process of nature as sort of gardener or tender. And this is why it's so important to understand that we have a nature and that it's connected to nature, and that it is important that we embody this nature to the best possible extent. Because if you think of us as, as creatures which are meant to express the truth to each other in terms of social interaction, and that's how we all come to understand the truth better, and that, adapt, ad that enables all of us together to adapt in the best possible way together and eliminates conflict, well, think about the fact that we are embodied creatures which have evolved over several billion years within this world. That means that most likely... The perceptual structures which we've evolved are used in order to see the world in the most adapt 
adaptively effective way. And so if we naturally, as Peterson, Jordan B. Peterson suggests, see the world in terms of archetypal images, in particular, the father, the mother, and a child, and we start with the mother as, as uh, the world because the mother is very large and gives us all nourishment, and this has been the case for uh, essentially every human who has ever existed. Um, and with the, there are, there are no, and even if you are an orphan, it is still the fact of the matter that you have a mother and you have a father, um, hmm. even if you do not know them. You had to have them in order to be, to be a being. And in fact, if you watch orphan movies, that's often the theme coming to grips with the fact of having an image of father and mother, feeling that loss, and then trying to find someone else to project those archetypes onto in the world and making mm -hmm. it work. And in particular, I think of Annie as a great example of this. And so yeah. if that's how we naturally see the world, then there might well be some indication that that's how the natural world is made up <laughs> of social relationships. Uh -huh. And so uh -huh. social not only in terms of like, say, your friends and things, but social in terms of things are all moving around you in certain ways and acquiring and giving off information. And it is to your best interest to observe the fact of these relationships because everything changes when one thing changes because all things are connected, not only within say an ecosystem, but mm -hmm. within say our even higher level ecosystems. And so something that uh, George or uh, our ecosystems of thought Mm -hmm. um, which we then express to each other. And so two things about that. One, in a system or in a people who start to repress free thinking and uh, through free speaking, we no longer or we become less capable of sharing the information that we naturally glean, perhaps without even noticing it. And so we become more isolated from each other precisely because we say that you can't say certain things even though you've seen them, even though that would be extremely important to us because – it is the things we do not want to see that it is uh, most useful for us to uh, have shown to us by those who have seen them. Mm -hmm. And so if we just limit them and say what they say is unpleasant or uncouth or should not be the case, which I see so frequently now, well, then we just close our eyes to that which we dislike, which would be useful to uh, further social adaptation to the world. And so it is us attempting in a Luciferian way, an intellectual way to alter our nature precisely in order to keep our nature from telling us the things we don't want to hear. <laughs> and so we quiet each other in order to quiet the voices in our own heads, uh, it, as if that's actually where truth comes from, a voice in your head. The, uh, Dostoevsky suggested those are demons. And I would say yeah. that I, I uh, Peterson, Jung, and I would agree with that too. Perhaps listen to your heart, your emotions, or your subcortical uh, systems that are sending up, you know, I, uh, that are sending up images and emotions into your your head. And I mean, look at the power of both of poetry, of movies, of drama, of dance. It's like, why are those things more interesting than a lecture? <laughs> Precisely because they activate more of your being when you are there. They they inform you with more information in a non-articulated way and so you need to pay attention to that or you naturally pay attention to that because there's just so much there and so if we stop expressing ourselves and how we feel and how we actually see the world we are potentially keeping our natural process of adaptation or microevolution from happening which at this point in history most frequently happens with us like a bee with a flower through the, the, the sharing of information through speech, through articulated yeah. speech. The, uh, the way that that seems to bubble up these days, though, is like the more that you try to, to shut down certain kinds of speech, the more that it comes out in other forms, like spoken word poetry has become so huge and, um, you know, dance and, uh, you know, more kinds of chaotic or if not chaotic, then at least really tense and urgent sort of sounding music you know it's not it's not following classical norms of restraint anymore mm -hmm. so those those forms are sort of breaking up like even poetry so much poetry is just free verse and and there's like no connection to any kind of stylistic form because there's just there's all this stuff that you just feel like you have to say and it's just coming out you know this is how people talk about it and it's what's well, so interesting because traditionally right like 
those kinds of things were the conversation of the people. And then the artistic forms were the forms that were restrained, classical, uh, you know, placing things in their proper l- relation to one another. And there was a kind of, there was a kind of natural chain between those, but, but over time, it seems that uh, it's, the situation has become much more muddled and confused, you know? So yeah, yeah, go ahead. That's right. That's right. And just to add like humanities departments at universities. Now there used to be a for the humanities, like St. John's where we went, where one goes through a curriculum of learning the history of Western thought. It's yeah. mathematics, it's science, it's philosophy, it's literature, it's drama. And the idea there is that, of course, that is a limited education. The choice made is that that's the best possible education you can make for your uh, top tier education, your college education. Um, yeah. When you destroy a model like that or dismiss it, you dismiss it on inappropriate grounds. The grounds usually dismissing it are it's not diverse enough. That's the wrong way to look at it. Hmm. The appropriate way to look at it is it is a perfect representation of what it is. Perhaps uh, it could be transformed to be slightly better, but that's a very different conversation of what hmm. would be added and what would be subtracted. There's already quite a bit that's good that's there, and there's a body of tradition behind it that's ve- yeah. very long at this point. Um, and so – the problem now with humanities departments is that they are more diverse and that they have more course offerings, but they're also far more superficial and shallow because how many courses can you take? How long a line of tradition can yeah. you go through during your college education? If say you take like two Caribbean studies classes, an ancient philosophy class, a feminist philosophy class, you're getting a smattering of all of these things. And so right. there's even a, uh, a, a sort of postmodernization or uh, uh, um, a, a loss of structural form in what a humanities education happens to be now, rather than a process of enculturation by which one learns the virtues and vices of the past, specifically one's own people, because of their direct relevance to where one currently lives, which is an important fact to keep in mind, mm-hmm. uh, because one is subject to those laws and behavioral patterns and cultural norms, um, <clears throat> and one should learn what they are and why they exist rather than simply criticizing them without understanding the reason that they exist and not indi- understanding one's social nature. Um, mm-hmm. Then one, sorry, losing my train of thought, going on that screen again. Um, then, the, uh, and I know I'm right at the end of it. I'm sorry. I think it seemed like you're coming back to the tree image. You, know, you, you mentioned like culture and in that sense of kind of engrafting something else into what's already there. Or, or yes, a humanities education. So, what yeah. what you have is that you have just these several different sort of diverse uh, uh, classes suggesting that one's education is like flipping through the TV. It's like you watch <laughs> this show for a little while, you watch this show for a little while, you watch this show for a little while, and it's all sort of interesting. And what it indicates is a structural lack of values. Yeah. There's not a hierarchy of values. Yeah. Yeah. Like the tree indicates – yeah. Um, and being itself a hierarchical structure uh, with differing parts, which use differing functions. It has the trunk, it has the roots, it has the branches, it often has the leaves or the flowers on them, just as the generations of man are. So are leaves on the tree, says both Apollo and Glaucus in the Iliad. And um, so you just get so much less out of your education because you don't go nearly as deep into your own people and therefore into the people and therefore into your own nature. The whole point is not that it's Western culture that you need to teach. Mm. It's that you need to teach some culture and we (laughs) happen to be in the West. And so West earned culture tends to be the best to teach because we know it the best. And by knowing it the best, we can get deeper and deeper every single generation into understanding ourselves and our own natures so that we don't simply have to criticize the evil that has existed in the past and therefore obviously exists in the present. But we can work to transform ourselves so that we can fight this evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the idea of the, the kind of um, orchard or something like that of, of – uh, of a curriculum, right? You, the image there seems to be like you've got this kind of wall. Isn't that what curriculum refers to? There, there's a kind of uh, I, it, circle. It, it's a running. It's oh, okay. A, yeah, I, yeah. 
a curry curry is to run okay and so it's like a stream yeah. so it, there is a binding element but also a moving element yeah. there yeah and I, and I like to think about it sort of as a you have you have all the different you know trees there that you could imagine um and each one sort of represents a particular uh, either work or author or culture or, or period of time however you want to think of it but but mm -hmm. you know you you can't uh you can't infinitely graft them all together there's there's limitations to do that because otherwise they die you know and, and you can you can go and you can wander through them and as much as you like and, and enjoy their shade and and their smell and the beauty of the light on the leaves and all that you know this is the sort of thing uh that, that tolkien talks about too he talks about the tree of tales um you know and, mm. and he he knew the the northern the western culture as well as anybody um and and created you know his own beautiful sort of patchwork of well maybe a better to say it's it is sort of organic his 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 own mythology um so kind of out of out of the the learning that he had uh but but you get this this ability um the more that you study any one of those trees you know to to appreciate the nature of that of that structure itself right so like studying any language right you understand more about language itself. And then you can talk to other people who might know a lot about other languages than you do. And you can have like a very fruitful conversation because- And you can yeah. actually learn what's different between you two and what's diverse. And then you can reintegrate that information. I guess we would call that appropriation today yeah. Yeah. and thus enrich your culture and theirs. And that's a whole point of information transmission in the first place. No. Mm -hmm. And I- it's just funny that you say that because it's like when you think of the tree of knowledge, how I teach this to my students is the tree of knowledge is a book. Mm -hmm. It's like a book. It is that which transmits information to you and in giving you greater information and knowledge of your own nature, it instills knowledge of the fact that you can suffer and will someday die. Mm -hmm. And so the cost of knowledge, just like Odin on Yggdrasil losing an eye to acquire the capacity to speak or read magic runes that means the the ability to read the information that is latent in a situation and to acquire it and then express it in a way that all can understand because language is that which is shared between uh people uh well when you read from that book you can then share it you can then share it with others and when you share it with others that reveals not only what is the same in you your nature and that which is uh, isomorphic, but also what is truly different and unique and interesting. And so it d helps you to discover not only your shared human nature, but perhaps even your destiny as a unique person within a unique time and a unique situation. And perhaps that even makes you value the people around you in a much deeper way because they're part of your actual story. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, to to go into like the the Odin story, I don't know as much about that one, but uh, it is interesting how you have this kind of echo of the idea that Odin sort of wanders around looking like kind of a you know a, a dirty old like vagabond, and he sort of mm -hmm. appears, and then people either um, you know give him hospitality, and and they avoid you know horrible things, or they or they fail to they fail to recognize. Uh, what what's going on and and then horrible things happen to them uh they, yes they sort just of... like with zeus yeah. traveling with hermes exactly. exactly uh and just and just like uh the angels travel in the old testament yeah. traveling uh to um sodom and gomorrah yeah. as well it seems to be the main idea behind all of those myths is that when you fail to recognize the information laden in a situation you will not adapt to the correct situation and that will, regardless of how much time it takes, lead to ruin. Well, that and and also just that, like the God is right there, whether you recognize yes. him or not, right? And and you know maybe he is broken down and weak and um, you know being thrashed and being executed, whatever. You know, it's still the God, right? So so right. it's still information. It doesn't matter whether it's good or bad valence. Yeah. It's yeah, and you know, interesting. Several things on that is. 
That is the Osiris myth of uh-huh. Horus going down to get his desiccated and old dead father, his, the old order and to restore it in a new way, or the idea of order to be restored in a new way in a present circumstance that allows for life and growth. But also it calls to me um, a Jungian quote. So Jung on the, um, on the, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the term for the top of a door, excuse uh, the, uh, the entryway to his home okay. had a Latin phrase, which was uh, vocatus atque non vocatus deus adorit, which means summoned or unsummoned. God is present. Yeah. And it recalls to me also Heraclitus, the story of Heraclitus that I heard from the wonderful Dr. Owen Goldman of Marquette University, is that once several students, three or so, went to find the great philosopher Heraclitus and they found him, but he was in very humble, a very humble abode sort of like where Jesus was born and uh, was in some small sort of, uh, you know, dilapidated home. And he was, he was cold and he was just warming his hands over the fire. And when he looked up and saw the students who were, you know, in disbelief, they expected some Menelaian, pa- uh, you know, palace or some, some great, what is it that they would expect from going to see a great philosopher? Something greater than what they see, right? Mm-hmm. I expected you to be taller is what we always hear of our heroes, right? And um, he said, he said, uh, enter, enter, or even in here, gods are present. Yeah. And so, right, it's not for us to judge the situation before we enter into it, just like Teddy Roosevelt says of the person who enters the arena as opposed to the critic. And we do have a generation of critics now. Wow. So many educated people, so many people who have left the cave but do not go back into the cave. They deal only in their own thoughts, which have little to no connection to reality. In fact, we have full-scale social debates on things like the existence of gender, which all you have to do is go look at powerlifting records, which is the ultimate expression of strength. And if you want to see something, whether there is a difference in strength between genders, well, for one, you can go across the biological kingdom and figure this out, particularly with mammals who are close ancestors. If you don't accept biology in that way, accept practicality. Um, Mm -hmm. In powerlifting, which is pure expression of strength through three major lifts, which is agreed upon by all who lift. And if you don't lift and therefore disagree, you should understand why. Um, Then get people of the same weight, men and women, which is how they divide, just as our Olympics divide Mm -hmm. those categories. Um, Give them the same lift, the power lift, correct for adding testosterone to them through steroids. So you can make the claim, well, what if I give testosterone to a woman and make her into a man? I would say you can still give testosterone to a man and make him more of a man (laughs) because the world record will almost always be around 70%. The woman will have 70% of the man. In fact, if I think about the the most ever, I think the most a woman has ever pulled is close to 700 pounds in geared, which is incredible. What the most a man has ever pulled is over a thousand. Yikes. And so that means that there are clear and demonstrable differences between the gender in terms of strength, corrected for size, lift, uh, and testosterone development. It's just it that that's a present fact. Yeah. Um, that's not a prejudice or an opinion. The the arguments about those kinds of things always seem to become absurd pretty quickly um, to, right. to somebody who considers themselves a sort of uh common sense observer i guess uh well anyway but but the uh but the the whole idea that people then become sort of soured on the whole idea, the whole possibility of conversation is it seems mm-hmm. to me the, the the more dangerous sort of um outcome of of such purposeless uh debates like then you yeah and it would agree be that you it would be a problem about things yeah sorry. Uh, just that just that you you then think well there's no point in talking about things at all you know with certain yeah right a, a, exactly and I, I would say that's not the only problem but i'm forgetting what i was thinking was the problem about um <laughs> uh, uh, uh if if you are unwilling to admit differences which clearly do exist in the world and therefore stop considering information transmission as one, a possibility, which is solipsistic, and two, a necessity, well then you must have a delusional idea that there is some other way by which we can adapt to reality, which is better than through language. And so 
The problem with that thinking is that it takes quite a bit in order to have a shared language. There needs to be a, a shared morality, a shared rule structure, a shared behavioral structure underneath because you have to actually get to where you can talk to somebody, right. which is something we quickly forget. And so what recourse do we have for solving conflicts if not through language? Well, I mean, boom, yeah. violence. violence it's like we don't have a we're not just going to evolve a better structure than language if we decide we're angry at language yeah. because we get angry at each other when we speak to each other because we tell each other things we don't want to hear. It's like, grow up. Yeah. Uh, there's The only other recourse is violence. And so I actually thought this through the other day. So why would that still be to the postmodernists or the bureaucrats' uh, advantage? Well, if we have created a society in which violence is also not allowed is increasingly allowed less and less for young boys in schools with larger and larger consequences. Yeah. Well, then the only recourse you have is actually legal. And then boom, who has all the power, right? right. Who has all the power? All the, that would be the bureaucrats again. So what you do is you define away the use of language. Well, of course, using language to acquire your powers, which uh, are purely language because they're mitigated by the fact of a body of rules, which you have helped to create, which maintain only the structure you have, uh, you have created rather than that which it is supposed to serve. And, and then you make it so that those who have intelligence no longer have a voice. Then you make it so that those who have strength aren't allowed to use the strength. It reminds me quite a bit of Animal Farm, yeah. in fact, in the use of the horse by the, the tyrant pigs yeah. until it, it died. Um, and so it's like, huh, that actually makes, if you consider humans, you start with the fact that humans are smart and will work in their own interests. It's like, that's a very smart scorpion right there. <laughs> it's, I mean, uh, it, it makes sense to me. I don't think it necessarily was like somebody sat down and drew up a master plan, but that does of course. seem to be the long-term outcome of the kind of uh, basic, uh, basic government and, and legal structure that we seem to be operating under and the sorts of the sorts of stories that we tell ourselves um, in, in daily discourse rather than the sorts of deeper stories which underlie all of that and the sort of unexamined assumptions which are there, which you have to, right, because to, it's, to get back to. <laughs> yeah. Right, because it's so solipsistic because the idea behind it is that it bec the bureaucracy itself becomes some sort of mind entity which is immortal and totally abstracted from the facts of reality and nature and can maintain itself without transmitting information because it already knows all the information. And so it's sort of like a defective image of God. And so being it is actually an image of Satan, right? Because it thinks that it knows everything and it will fall. Why? Because it doesn't recognize its roots to these deeper mythological uh, stories because what a mythological story will tell you like the tower of Babel is what up, what goes up must come down. doesn't matter how long it takes. Yeah. And so if you become disintegrated or abstracted away from reality, again, it doesn't matter. You're already done. In so far as you keep rising, you will fall. And that's what's happening. And uh, that's why I think there's tremendous value in discussing these deep mythological stories rather than no value. I mean, something I often ask my students, I was like, I say, if these are the deepest mysteries possible, does that make them uh, – does that mean that we should not investigate them or that we should spend as much time as possible investigating them because there's the most possible value in investigating them because we have never found the bottom yeah. to them. Yeah. It's like saying the ocean is very big. Let's just study the lakes. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no, no. The place where, yes, of course, it is going to be the most humbling search because we're going to see how small we are and how, how interconnected we are to all things, which perhaps will make us not feel meaningless and insignificant, but part of something much larger than we are. And it strikes me that we're going exactly the wrong. So if we are now feeling meaningless and turning to drugs and having to go to therapy because we don't have some sort of shared vision, it strikes me as we are doing the opposite thing from what you would do in order to reacquire that vision. Because in becoming more solipsistic and uh, incapable or unwilling to listen to others and therefore incapable of learning one's own nature, one becomes an island, isolated, hell, like Lucifer in the ninth circle of, 
uh, uh, Dante's hell, constantly chewing on sinners, just chewing on things and doing nothing like a cow chewing on the cud. And, but if we were to say, realize we were interconnected with all things, not only that exist now, but exists in the past and in the future, which is certainly true. Boom. <laughs> Wouldn't that act of humility give ultimate meaning to all of our lives? Just like a drone ant has ultimate meaning in its life, even though it is small, it has pure purpose and is helping to create something greater than itself. Huh. The ant hill, yeah. So that'd be a that'd be a is that um no it's the it's the bees, isn't it? The bees in the Aeneid, not the ants. Yes, it is the bees. It's always the bees. Yeah. Bees at the top of Dante's heaven. Okay. Bees, uh, bees in ritual with their honey, and bees in uh, uh, both the Georgics and in the Aeneid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, okay. But that back, back to the tree for a minute. So, so there seems to be a kind of emphasis on this involving um, recognition, or I guess another way of putting that is, is like you're describing remembering, like remembering your roots or something. Yes, remembering, bringing the members back in. Yeah, but it also, so that's also going to imply that there's a kind of um, a struggle um, between the the growing upwards tendency. There's there's at least a kind of tension there. Mm. Right? Like you're, you're constantly like aspiring and competing with other things around you to get to the light and, and gain uh, nourishment and whatnot. But then there's this corresponding, like equal and opposite sort of struggle down into the dirt and past the rocks and through, you know, the burrows of the animals that are gnawing at your roots. You know, you're sort of always like digging down just as much. Yes. Right. And I think the yeah, go on. It's just, just to like, so to, to illustrate that, I guess you, you've got, you know, a, a mythological story like the um, the God on the cross, right? So it's like you put him up there, and and you kill him, and then you put him under the ground, and you and he's dead. Um, and so mm. you've, two, you've got those two sort of directions, really strongly, like like starkly um, put before you in those kinds of in those kinds of pictures. And that was like that was the that was the thing that you would like stare at if you were. Of human being in 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 Europe for like a thousand years, you would just like stare at that image, um, and still, and like, and just contemplate that. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and so just to articulate what that is, is the way down is the way up, and so I think our initial desire doesn't accord with the habits of action necessary in order to achieve that desire. You want to go up, and so you just look up. Yeah. You just look up at the good things, the ideals, the heroes. You learn the stories. But then you realize that you need to look down, which means within. You have to see the hero that you've seen in ideal stories within yourself, and then you have to dig into the dirt, and you have to do the work necessary to build the foundation in order to aspire upwards. And the deeper you go into yourself – by actual action in the world, which reveals to yourself who you are and actually will turn on new genes and new situations from you, which we have on good evidence from Peterson uh, quoting good evidence. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that is what actually will send your fame to the stars or, or even to put it less prosaically will help. It is in doing real things in the world that you actually accomplish real things in the world and what is growing a trunk and uh, tremendous branches than accomplishing accomplishing actions in the world. Yeah. Um, and you do that by working, not by sitting around and pontificating about how the world could be better if you were the king of it or if things were different. No, you're missing a step there. Yeah. Improve the world as if you were a tool put in the world in order to improve it in the specific way that you are capable of doing that. Yeah. And so when you see flaws, when you think of how the world could be better, it's like, great. That's why you exist. <laughs> you can go work on that now. It's like, if you think wisdom doesn't exist, why don't you start a podcast and share some thoughts on great literature? Or why don't you go be a teacher of great literature? Or, you know, if you see a problem, it strikes me that you shouldn't just sit down resentfully and stare at the problem and while imagining a world that didn't have that problem, I'm imagining right now a student sitting with like a, a hamburger wrapper in front of him, imagining a world in which the hamburger wrapper weren't in front of him. It's like, pick it up, 
yeah. throw it away. Yeah. And you know what? You may have even developed the habit of, you might say condescendingly, well, that's just a very small problem he fixed. It's like, but that might help to instill the habit of fixing problems which are apparent to him, which might eventually lead to him even being able to deal with problems which are not so apparent to him or to others, huh. which means that the better you get at solving easy problems, the problems in front of you, clean your room, make your bed, clean up your social relationships with those around you, perhaps the better you get at seeing the invisible connections between all things. Because if we are isomorphic and you learn how to clean up the things around you, is there not some indication that all things are in some way similar to those things you interact with on a daily basis right. in some way or another? It's like that's the pattern that you can you can see, right? And that's the tree too. Like in a in a level of of just sort of mm. abstraction, like the tree is the image of those relationships, right? It's like you have certain things that are closer to you, and then you have connections to certain things that are a little ways away, and then you have this kind of infinite, some you know, limited but apparently infinite branching to all the other possible things that are out there that you could eventually touch and do and and accomplish right so it's like it's like a map you know which is actually a perfect way of uh you know uh, the nervous system is often compared to looking like the tree and what does it branch out ultimately into the things by which we touch hands so that was just a funny connection yeah i made while you were saying that and also that's interesting too if we consider ourselves like the leaves on the tree as uh, glaucus who was about to die by dami's hands but somehow managed not to uh, by gaining immortality through that story. If we consider ourselves the leaves on the tree, then it, that, I think that's an interesting way of looking at it. The people around us are the proximate leaves that are very close. The branches are the traditions that they're part of that are slightly different from yours. Perhaps they're differing families or cities. Mm -hmm. The trunk is itself the great tradition, uh, perhaps the nature of man itself. And the roots, well, man, they're even deeper. That's, you know, from our, you know, pre pre-human history and apparently those diverge some too i'm not exactly sure all what to do with the roots i don't fully understand them but they do seem to be in some way also a reflection of the branches um yeah. potentially suggesting that we are ourselves a reflection of that which is much lower in our mind than our consciousness and that the point of consciousness might be to articulate and uh, a to articulate a life and strategy towards existence that properly puts into a natural hierarchy, which is correct, the motivations that exist within us, which we cannot get rid of and attempt to repress to our own and our own social peril. Um, because the more of us who do that as imitative creatures, the more of us who do that. Um, and so to get the relatively uh, rare, as Peterson says, uh, hero figure, you, you have to be willing to use your consciousness to see that which is uh, already in you, pre-programmed in, sub subcortical, and then to arrange yourself as best as possible according to that rather than to say that doesn't exist and then that just act like a mess throughout life and, and, and actually messing other people up through suggesting that their attempts at hierarchy or, or organization uh, are false or wrong, which seems to be what we do with the religions because we're incapable of understanding the method by which they come to truth and what the truth is. We suggest that they don't have a method for coming to truth and are therefore untrue. And all that they do is uh, irrational and therefore uh, uh, error ridden and therefore should not be done. Right. Uh, which is totally wrong because we don't understand. I mean, religion isn't, a, it grows up. It's a, it's a cultural universal. So it's not culturally constructed at all. It is, Religions differ in the same way that trees differ. Again, yeah. yeah. And they all have similar structures, but are beautiful in their own unique ways, given the resources to which they have access, i.e. the people who embody them. Um, and so it strikes me that these are like states, natural ways by which people come to organize their behavior together so that they can be predictable to each other so that they can live in a cooperative and peaceful and ultimately safe and stable way. And that strikes me as not unimportant yeah. to human uh, prosperity and to human uh, uh, and to our own humanity. That strikes me as ultimately important. Sure. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, 
again like a like a like another um, flower word, right? Perennial. It's a kind of perennial. Yes. Uh, as as often as it dies in the winter, it rises, you know, again in the spring. Uh, and with with the idea of um, you know, sort of to take the the counter stance to that, right? So like suppose that you get a religion that is too dominant, right? That shadows mm. over all the others. So that's that's clearly not like desirable either right and and there's you know the establishment uh clause in, in the constitution right so preventing the government from being directly connected with any particular religion or uh other sort of dominant structure of that kind to to preserve tolerance for all of these different things again it's like in the garden in your in your curriculum garden you don't want to have one thing that's that's so big and and overshadowing and stealing all of the the available uh, nutrients from everything else around it, like then there's there's no, you know, because we're conver we're conversational beings, like we we need people to to interact with on on a on a somewhat equal footing, or else there's there's just no there's just no point anymore. Right. Um, right. In Milton's Paradise Lost, the largest tree in Eden is the tree of life, which means that the thing that overshadows is the thing that gives light. It's life. Uh, it's an, it's not a uh, that's the thing that we're serving, the maximal expression of life. Now, that's ultimate di diversity right there when you think of a beautiful garden and everything being able to thrive in conjunction with everything else because of a master or gardener properly placing everything in its appropriate place because it understands each thing's nature best. And it's like, boom. Well, that's like that, Laertes. Yeah. The end of the Odyssey. After all the adventures, you get to Laertes in his, in his garden, you know, uh, shoveling away and I just I just love that that image and yeah yes Laertes sort of like an old dead god in a garden there who needs to be redeemed by his son coming to reinvigorate him and not only his son but his son and his grandson who then compete for valor in front of his eyes showing him the strength of his own you you might say seed um uh and the generational uh and just how through intelligent planting and cultivating as a farmer, the farm has improved the farm being his genealogical line and how that not only is good for him, but his entire society is the fact that his, it is Odysseus, the ultimate hero who helps to defeat the Trojans that helps the Achaeans quite a bit as an entire people, which they were not yet. And also at a local level that helps the Ithacans because they have a tremendous leader who Never, who almost never loses, who is very strong and savvy. And so through cultivating uh, a, a wonderful son, Laertes has actually cultivated something that has helped the entire world, except for, of course, the Trojans. Though even the Trojans, if you consider the fact that the fact that they lose in Troy leads to them through Virgil suggesting that they lead to the coming of the Romans. And so literally for everybody, <laughs> and even the suitors, because they get kept alive forever, through uh, uh, the story of Odysseus. Yeah. So even the people that lose to Odysseus are immortalized. Even the fools that die near him, Elpinor is immortalized. Oh, I love Elpinor. Um, yeah. We, uh, yeah, my students say that they can never, ever forget Dolon from the Iliad or Elpinor. <laughs> that just as, just as Odysseus is scarred on his knee and just as Dante says that he has a scar across the world, so is the knowledge of Dolon and Elpinor forever scarred on them. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that's good because you should know exactly why these men fail and why they are in these stories. Yeah. It's like, can you make dumb choices and exit the game out of nowhere in a meaningless way? Yes. <laughs> don't. <laughs> that's always don't possible. text and drive. Yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, yes, you have to be very smart pretty much all the time uh you you can only afford to be so dumb in so many situations there's a very dangerous world we live in uh, um and, and we're very da dangerous creatures ourselves that's what every one of our movies is about there's conflict there's fighting there's death um and even when it's with aliens the aliens are just like us right. or embodiments of something in us um that is going to consume us and so it's like yeah and i mean that would be the evolutionary purpose of movies right not to represent worlds that don't exist but to represent our world in a way that is uh imagistically captivating in order to teach us something about the world and so to convey some information to us which is true that helps us to adapt to our current state and reality best yeah 
<clears throat> yeah. Well, I we, I uh, I do have to get going here. Um, sorry to to cut this one a little shorter, but um, our bounded Hal, garden. How's how's moving castle for next time? Is that right? Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. All right. We're back on video, so off the radio again. So, well, I thought this was a great success, and I love talking about this with you, uh, Wes. And could you tell all the viewers what it is you are about to go do, speaking about our, our conversation about culture, gardens, trees, and crosses? Well, yeah, it's that time of year. We're going to the uh, Community College Garden Expo once again. And, uh, yeah, you know, maybe getting some things for the garden, maybe just to be outside and look around. Very good. I'm sure you'll get something out of the experience, sure. no matter what it is sure. you do. And everybody remember who's listening to subscribe to Bookworm Games uh, um, or book, Bookworm Books, Bookworm Games. I'm always Early, forgetting that for some Early reason. I'm sorry. Games. No, so the project is to do games and then books and sort of alternate between them. And so right now we're studying Earthbound. And uh, yeah, by all means, check it out. Uh, wonderful well i've been learning a ton from that i've been learning a ton and i really am looking forward to podcasting with you soon talking about uh similarities and differences between earthbound and final fantasy 7 yeah. and differences within our own upbringings and our own personalities and characters yes um, that's on the docket yes looking all right well wonderful well i hope you have a wonderful time and um say hi to miss wonderful stephanie bell yep. too yeah. she says and that. Oh, hello. Hello. Back to her. And well, looking forward to doing this again soon. All right. Take care. Thanks again. You too.